Chapter 17, Respiratory Emergencies. The beginning few slides of this chapter are going to be a recap of things that we've covered in the airway and breathing chapters, along with some of the perfusion chapters. Nonetheless, the key points are important to remember and stuff that's going to really impact your overall assessment and treatment capabilities. So as a review, respiration itself is the exchange of gases. We've discussed in the past how ventilation is a mechanical movement of air in and out of the lungs, whereas respiration is the actual exchange of gases at the alveoli level. We also have a cellular respiration, which is the exchange of gases at the cellular level. In order for respiration to occur, we must be able to move the air in and out. So the process of ventilation requires the use of the diaphragm. The diaphragm, the intercostal muscles, and other accessory muscles will work to expand the chest cavity, drawing air into the chest itself, and then allowing it to passively escape while it relaxes. You'll see in this slide here, the diaphragm itself is relaxed. And in the relaxed state, it's actually somewhat arched. And what that does is it allows the chest cavity to recompress. The intercostal muscles relax, so the chest falls back in. It compresses the air inside the chest and forces it back out. So the inhalation process is active. In order for us to breathe air in, we have to actively use muscle and energy to expand the chest cavity. When that happens, the air pressure inside the chest is lower than the air pressure outside the body. As a result, pressure or air rushes in to equalize those pressures and the exchange of gases occur. As my chest relaxes and the, the chest walls fall and the diaphragm arches back up again, it ends up compressing the air inside the chest. And as a result, it, it rushes back out of the body in order to try to equalize pressure once again. So the inhalation process requires energy. Exhalation is passive and does not require energy. That's an important concept to remember because as our patient continues to go through the respiratory distress phases, over time, that skeletal muscle that's helping them to breathe is going to become fatigued. Those intercostal muscles and even the diaphragm can start to tire out over time. So if we're not able to continuously uh, meet the respiratory demands of our body, the oxygen demands, uh, we're going to continue to increase the rate trying to meet that. Over time, though, those muscles will fatigue, they will get tired, and they'll start to, to die out. And we'll have to, as EMS providers, we'll have to step in and intervene, providing some level of positive pressure ventilations. So again, the inhalation process is, it requires energy. Exhalation is passive. Over time, with inhalation, because it does require energy, if those muscles fatigue, they're not going to be able to breathe effectively. And the EMS provider would have to step in and provide some level of positive pressure ventilation then. So when we evaluate the overall respiratory quality of a patient, we want to determine whether or not it's sufficient to support life. And we, we ask ourselves, is this breathing effort adequate? And we look at a handful of different components when we're determining what's adequate. We want to know not only the patient's respiratory rate, depth, and regularity, but we also want to look at their overall mental status, the, the skin color, determine whether or not they're cyanotic or pale. We want to look at their blood pressure, their pulse rate, evaluate whether or not we have a VQ match with the ventilation and perfusion. Um, there's just a lot that we have to look at. So a single vital sign or a single respiratory assessment isn't necessarily going to be sufficient in order to give us the big picture. However, if we walk up to a patient and they're in a tripoding position, they're actively working hard to breathe, they're distressed, they're asking for help, do I need to do much more than that to determine that they should be provided with oxygen? The answer is of course not. When we walk up, we can use that gut instinct or that general impression of the patient to determine that we need to act aggressively with oxygen therapy. So keep that in mind. We always want to do a full and complete assessment. We want to be able to see the big picture, identify the underlying causes, and make sure that we're treating those. But at the same time, if the patient is in obvious distress and they're really struggling, do not ever hesitate to provide them with some level of oxygen therapy. This slide here actually addresses some of the signs and symptoms of somebody who is breathing adequately. And while that's fine and dandy, I'm pretty sure everybody listening to this right now could look at the person next to them and figure out what a patient looks like when they are breathing normal. More importantly, what we want to determine is whether or not they're breathing abnormally.
or whether or not their breathing is not adequate. One of the things we'll look at is their overall rate. Now you'll see on the slide here that there are some norms based on different age groups, 12 to 20 for adults, 15 to 30 for a child, 25 to 50 for an infant. Take note the relationship between the rate and age. The younger the child, the higher the rate. As we get older, our respiratory rate, as does our pulse rate, begins to slow down. When we're evaluating this, we want to look at not just the rate itself, but also consider what's what led up to this. You know, if a normal resting adult breathes between 12 and 20 times per minute, and we're evaluating somebody who just finished running a marathon, we would expect their respiratory rate to be increased. It's increased in order to provide the additional oxygen that's necessary to meet the physical demands of the body. So simply being outside of the range doesn't necessarily tell us much. We want to know why they're outside of the range. You know, if somebody simply woke up in the middle of the night and they have a, an increased respiratory rate, then I have an underlying concern here. Additionally, when the rate goes up, that's a compensatory response, meaning that the body purposely increases the rate, trying to compensate for some type of deficiency. Rarely, though, if ever, does the respiratory rate go down for any reason other than something that is critical in nature. So if we observe a patient with a respiratory rate below what their norms are, um, I'm, I'm very, very, very concerned about those patients. There's a good chance that they're either going into respiratory failure at that point, or there could be some type of damage to the brainstem that's affecting their overall respiratory function. So these are things that uh, we need to again look at, not simply what is the rate, but if it's outside of the range, why is it outside of the range? And if it's above the range, if it's above the normal, why are they trying to compensate? And if it's below normal, then, hey, what is this critical issue that's going on? I need to immediately identify it because this patient is most likely going to be at risk for death or permanent injury or disability. So in addition to what we just talked about, this slide adds a couple other components in there. We've got the rate. We've got a little bit of regularity that we'll talk more about in a few minutes, but also the diminished or absent lung sounds. We want to listen to lung sounds and determine, do I hear a lot of air moving through the lungs there, or do I hear wheezing? Do I hear uh, bronchi? You know, is there some type of abnormality that would suggest there's something going on inside the lungs themselves? I also want to look at tidal volume. I'm looking at that by identifying chest rise. Do they have good equal chest rise on both sides? Are they taking good full breaths, or are they shallow? Uh, are they irregular? Those are all things that we want to identify to determine whether or not the patient is breathing adequately or not. And remember, any patient who is breathing inadequately, if it is not adequate, we need to be assisting them with ventilations. That is an absolute must. Also keep in mind that with the pediatric pa uh, population, their anatomy is much different than the adults. And the fact that their tongue is much larger within the overall area of their mouth than it would be of an adult. So although an adult's tongue is obviously larger than a child's, um, the uh, percentage of space that the tongue occupies inside the, the mouth is much larger in a child than it is in an adult. That means that the tongue can become an obstruction. It also means that any type of swelling or anything like that can be far worse. We know that the trachea in young children is not quite as rigid as it is in adult. Those cartilaginic rings that surround the trachea have not hardened in young children as they have with older children and adults. So therefore the trachea is kinked off a lot easier. Uh, the children also depend a lot on their diaphragm and even somewhat on their abdominal muscles for breathing. Whereas we as adults rely more on our intercostal muscles. So we are going to evaluate the presence of belly breathing in a child, which is normal. We're going to see more belly movement in a young child than we would chest rise. That is perfectly normal. What is not normal is what we call seesaw breathing. And that's where the chest is being sucked in as the belly is pushing out and vice versa. As the belly gets drawn in, the chest pushes out. When the chest and, and the belly are going opposite of each other like a seesaw would, that's an indication of critical uh, respiratory distress in a young child. Uh, additionally, with pediatrics, we can identify nasal flaring. Remember that especially babies are uh, nose breathers. So when we see that nasal flaring, the, the opening to the nostrils themselves flaring out with every breath, that's an indication of distress. Uh, Odd or abnormal sounds, such as grunting, would be another indication. 
seesaw breathing we just talked about, and retractions. Retractions is actually the, the, uh, the intercostal muscles are sucked in, and you can almost see the skeletal uh, components of the rib cage with every respiration. And that's pretty, pretty profound when it comes to uh, indications of respiratory distress. I've got a video here that I'm going to show you of retractions. They're not always super obvious to see, but it's something that we certainly need to be looking for. And once we see it, it becomes pretty obvious after that. Do you know what's going on with this patient? You can see his breathing. See how fast it is? See what's going on with the ribs? Do you know what it is? My name is Dr. Carlo Jed. Board Certified Emergency Physician with DrER.TV. Stay tuned to watch the rest of the video. We'll see something with pediatrician, depending on who's on, and they say, no, no, we can treat this here, and then if he doesn't improve, then we transfer him out. Hello there, Dr. Carlo Oye. In this video, we're going to see um, a very clear example of respiratory stress. This patient had clear intercostal retractions, which is when the patient takes each breath, you can see the ribs coming out underneath the soft tissue. And this is just a superb example of uh, intercostal retractions. But he also had suprasternal retractions as well, which we'll see in the video. So this is what we call a uh, suprasternal retractions. You see the, the soft tissue becomes more prominent every time you breathe because it's cooling. This is what I call intercostal retractions. Every time you breathe, you can see the ribs, and those are all the signs of distress. And of course, the, the speed of the breathing, which is why. Yeah, I even tried telling you to put your hands over the thing. Now, let's take a listen to what this patient sounded like when listening under a stethoscope. I used the echo stethoscope to listen to this patient's lungs, and here's the sounds. sounded pretty terrible, right? And that's after giving the patient Decadron. We gave him 8 milligrams IV. We gave him a Duonet, which is albutyl, and hypertrophic nebulized treatment. And he was still breathing 40-something times per minute. He was still having audible wheezing. You can see the retractions, intercostals, uh, supersternal. And the kid was getting tired. So we wanted to get the patient admitted for further treatment. However, uh, our hospital does not have a pediatric uh, floor or pediatric specialty, so we decided to uh, transfer the patient to Children's Hospital for further treatment and evaluation uh, to keep it managed there. Uh, all the things we did is we increased the Decadron's IV dose, we gave a repeat nebulized treatment, this time we used Sopinex, and we also started a magnesium drip. Magnesium is used as a second line agent for the treatment of acute bronchospasm or asthma. Uh, because what it does on the smooth muscle is relaxes it. So it allows those tight airways that have muscle fibers in it, they're all contracted and tight in an airway disease, to get dilated so the patient has more air going through and work with you better. So this is a, uh, a very superb example of severe bronchospasm or asthma attack in a pediatric patient. Probably one of the worst I've seen in a long, long time. And it was really amazing to be able to record those sounds and share them with you. That the Family members allow us to record the retractions so that you can see it, hear it, and learn it. So I hope you learned a lot.
Okay, so aside from uh, his accent there, the video was really good at showing just what those retractions look like. And the ability to hear those lung sounds was, uh, was really invaluable there. I can't stress enough that you should be listening to lung sounds every single opportunity you have. Lung sound assessment is something that has developed over time. Uh, it's not a skill set that you are just naturally good at. So you need to take every opportunity possible to listen to those lung sounds, not just be able to identify uh, what's abnormal, but actually identify specifically what you're listening to. Do you hear wheezing? Do you hear ronchi? You know, what are the different causes of those things? How should we treat them? All sorts of stuff like that. So considering inadequate breathing, when somebody's inadequate, what should we do? And we said just a little while ago that we need to assist them with ventilations. We need to breathe for them. Now, I will tell you, and this is going to be important to remember for the exam, that when delivering positive pressure ventilations, the most effective way at doing so is using a pocket mask with supplemental oxygen. That's an exam question. The most effective way to deliver positive pressure ventilations is using a pocket mask with supplemental oxygen. Secondary to that, we would be using a BVM with two separate rescuers, where one rescuer is able to hold the mask and the other rescuer is able to squeeze the bag. That ensures that we're maintaining an adequate seal during the entire time and we're delivering the appropriate volume of air. Beyond that, we also have some other devices such as that flow-restricted oxygen-powered ventilation device that very, very few places use, especially pre-hospital. Um, and then our last choice would be the One Rescuer BVM. Now keep in mind that if the patient has an advanced airway in place, a single rescuer BVM is perfectly acceptable. Um, it's only in the instances where we don't have a king tube, uh, an eye gel, or an endotracheal tube in place that we would want to use a BVM, I'm sorry, a, a pocket mask or something like that. Otherwise, if we have those tubes in place where we control the volume and it's going directly into the lungs itself, it's not a problem for a single rescuer to use that BVM. When we are ventilating our patient, we need to know the rates at which we're going to ventilate. So for an adult patient, we are going to ventilate them without an advanced airway 10 to 12 times per minute. A pediatric patient is 12 to 20 times per minute, and an infant would be a flat 20 times per minute. Now, again, notice the, uh, the relationship between the rate and age here. So the older the patient is, the less we ventilate them. For the 12 to 20 range in children there, you have to really start to, you got to be careful to keep these numbers separate because 12 to 20 is the normal respiratory rate for an adult, but it's the ventilatory rate if we're providing positive pressure ventilations for a child. So I would recommend that you make a little chart or a graph that kind of keeps all these things separate for you. Um, something that allows you to list the normal respiratory rate ranges for each age group and then also the ventilatory range or uh, ranges for each age group to keep all those numbers straight. So for 12 to 20 for a, a child, we know that child is technically one year of age all the way up through puberty. So if I have a one-year-old compared to a 13-year-old, should I treat them the same? And the answer is, of course not, right? They're very different at that point. So as a young child, I would expect you to be ventilating them in the 20 range, closer to 20. As they approach adolescence, you should be treating them more so as an adult, ventilating them at that rate of about 12. Along with that, though, is we have now end tidal CO2 monitoring, and that's part of the expanded scope here in Illinois. So in class, you should have talked about end tidal CO2 and how we can adjust our ventilation rates based on the number, the, the digital readout on our monitors. The normal range for end tidal CO2 should be between 35 and 45 millimeters of mercury. So that is the amount of, of uh, carbon dioxide that is measured at the end of each expiratory cycle. If the number is above 45, if we have a digital readout that shows that they're at 54 for their end tidal CO2 and we are ventilating the patient, we can increase our ventilatory rate marginally, so increase it by an extra breath or two per minute, and what that's going to do is that's going to start to breathe off that excess carbon dioxide. Conversely, if the number is below 35, they don't have enough CO2 in their body, I can slow my ventilatory rate down in an attempt at bringing that level back up. It's important that we maintain that range between 35 and 45 
because that's going to help maintain an, a neutral pH balance in the body and prevent the patient from becoming too acidic or too alkalotic. Now here's another disassociation between adults and children that's really important. For adults, as they become distressed, respiratorily distressed, their heart rate is going to increase along with the increase in respiratory rate. However, with a young child, if they become distressed and hypoxic, then their heart rate decreases. They become bradycardic. Two very big differences there. And the biggest issue that we run into with kids who are having perfusion issues is that they simply aren't breathing fast enough or that their uh, oxygen levels are too depleted. So we need to be very, very aggressive with oxygen therapy with our younger population because it can immediately lead, lead to overall perfusion and cardiac output issues. So going into breathing difficulty here, we know that somebody's complaint that they can't breathe or that they're having shortness of breath is subjective, right? We can't necessarily scientifically prove that they are or they aren't. But it's obviously easy enough to look at external signs if they're tripoding, if we do have those retractions or accessory muscle usages, uh, if they look generally fatigued, uh, if their respiratory rate is, is really high. These are all outward indicators that, yes, my patient is, in fact, uh, experiencing some level of respiratory distress. However, the patient can present 100% normal. They can look completely fine to us, no obvious indications of any issues whatsoever, but if they tell you that they're short of breath, then they're short of breath. It's not your job to, to prove them wrong. It's your job to identify their chief complaints, to ask appropriate questions to determine the potential causes, and to render the appropriate, appropriate care to address those chief complaints. So looking at this guy here, what do you see? And what we should be observing is that he's in a tripod position here. He, he's got some sunken eyes. He looks generally fatigued. I would even say that in this picture, he looks somewhat pale. And what he's doing is he's trying to take some of the pressure off his chest here, allowing his chest to expand more in order to get increased volume. Is this guy having difficulty breathing? Absolutely, I would say for sure. Now, how do we treat difficulty breathing? And there's a handful of different options. Um, obviously, oxygen therapy is, is the choice, but how are we going to deliver it? We have the choice between nasal cannulas and non-rebreather masks, bag valve masks, we can give CPAP, we can administer nebulizers. We have all these different tools in our toolbox. Which tool is most appropriate? What volume of air do I want to deliver? Um, is there a potential that I could harm the patient by giving them too much oxygen? These are all things that we need to know and that we should be considering as we go through it. Um, and by asking a good OPQRST uh, component of the sample history, that's going to really help out. You know, obviously identifying when it began, what they were doing when it began, if there's anything that makes it better or worse, was there anything that caused this to occur, um, are there any other associated symptoms, do they have a productive cough, uh, do they have any chest pain, you know, what, what are the underlying causes. A simple respiratory issue can be treated simply with oxygen. But if we incorporate a chest pain component now, um, what we want to do is be very careful not to over-oxygenate our cardiac patients. What ends up happening is that if we provide too much oxygen to our patient and we get to 100% on the SpO2, we end up having all these free radical oxygen molecules that are floating around in the bloodstream. And over time, we actually have a buildup of, of, without getting into too much detail, these free radicals. And when we finally get into the hospital and the hospital restores perfusion to the ischemic tissue from the, the heart blockage, or maybe it was a stroke or something else, these free radicals rush in and they attack that already damaged tissue and they do even, even more harm. So what I'm trying to say here is that with our cardiac patients, with our stroke patients, and we'll talk about COPD also, we really want to be uh, careful to titrate the oxygen. We want to give them only the oxygen that they need to experience relief and not a single bit more. We want to be careful not to get our SpO2 up to 100%. In fact, our SpO2 monitors have a margin of error of about 2 to 3%. If you have an adult patient with an SpO2 of 96%, that's that's perfect. You don't need to go any higher than that. There is the risk of going above 100%. And I know that sounds ironic because how can you go above 
But what that means is that the, the hemoglobin is at that point 100% saturated and any additional oxygen molecule that's being diffused into the bloodstream is now free floating and it's not attaching itself to the hemoglobin. So in fact, we can have that additional oxygen, which theoretically would take us above 100%. So we want to be very careful with that stuff. It will in fact do damage to our patients. Uh, we can ask some additional questions. Obviously, does the uh, is if there is pain, does it radiate anywhere? That shortness of breath, you know, is it, you know, does it feel like it hurts when you breathe, or is it uh, difficult to breathe, or you just feel like you can't get a full breath? Uh, can you describe on a scale of one to ten how difficult is your breathing? How long has this been going on? Is this something that's chronic? Do you have it all the time, or is this the first time you've ever experienced it? So getting a good history, um, a good understanding of what the the current situation is with our patient will help us to determine what the appropriate method is to deliver that oxygen. We can also do some basic observations to clue us in as to what could be going on with our patient and causing this breathing difficulty. Um, the barrel chest. Barrel chest over time, if I continue to work my intercostal muscles uh, above and beyond, if I'm chronically in respiratory distress, as I would expect with COPD patients, what happens is those intercostal muscles, which are skeletal muscle, they build up over time. No different than your biceps or triceps would if you go to the gym. And as that occurs, you start to develop this barrel chest, right? You lose some of the shape of the chest itself, and it all kind of rounds out. And that's typically indicative of that chronic respiratory patient. Tripoding position is easy to identify. That's going to tell us a lot. Sitting with the feet dangling or leaning forward would also clue us into the respiratory issues. Look at their overall work of breathing, you know, especially with kids. You know, if they're really using those retractions to, to try to assess or to assist them in, the, in each breath, um, you know, that, that should clue us in that this patient's in really, really bad shape and we need to be aggressive here. Uh, flared nostrils, pursed lips, and some of the other things that we've talked about already in this discussion. What does their skin look like? You know, are they pale? Are they cyanotic? Um, are they sweaty or clammy? You know, what are all these things that are cluing us into their overall perfusion status? There's a good chance that if I'm having respiratory issues, especially severe respiratory issues, I'm not delivering sufficient quantities of oxygen down to the cells. And if that's the case, that means I'm not perfusing. And as soon as the body realizes that certain cells, especially some of the more vital organs, aren't being perfused appropriately, it's going to start to shunt all the blood and thereby all the oxygen from the peripheral blood vessels in my arms and my legs and everything else, and it's going to shunt it in toward the core of my body. And it's going to take what oxygen it does have available, and it's going to make it readily available to the vital organs, the brain, the lungs, the heart, the liver, etc. The presence of any type of edema, pedal edema, uh, edema or sacral edema, is going to be a big indication as to what could be going on. So that pedal edema means that we have swelling in the feet, right down by the ankles there, and that could transfer all the way up toward the knees. The sacral edema is actually swelling, same thing, but it occurs in the lower back. So fluid that enters into the uh, into our torso and it settles toward the, the back of the, um, the abdominal cavity there could actually start to pull up and show that edema. Uh, any, in any case, pedal or sacral edema would be an indication of some type of pulmonary edema, right? We can assume that now there's fluid inside the lungs as well. By listening to lung sounds, we should be able to confirm that by listening to rails or crackles. But I do want to caution you that if you have edema in the patient and you listen to lung sounds and you don't hear rails or crackles, in fact, you don't hear anything at all, that could be caused by the fact that the patient's just not moving any air, right? There's so much fluid inside their lungs that you don't hear any air movement whatsoever. So by not hearing rails or crackles, that doesn't tell you that there isn't any fluid. It could just mean that there's so much fluid you can't hear anything else. Take a look at this guy here. You know What is it that you notice? First and foremost, I see that he's wearing a nasal cannula already. He's got one of those tanks on wheels. This tells me he's probably on this. He's, he's a chronic respiratory patient. Um, and then let's look at his physical features. He's tripoding. He's leaning forward. Do you see how his chest is rounded out a little bit? He's got that barrel chest. Um, these are all things that I should be identifying. Hey, this guy is in tough shape. I see the presence of some minor retractions here. Um, I see his neck muscles that are being sucked in. These are all accessory muscles that he's using to try to help himself breathe. 
So all things that I should be picking up on as I physically observe my patient. So as we're doing those observations, as we're listening, we should be uh, looking or trying to identify the presence of any of these things and associating with the uh, associating these sounds with an underlying cause that can be treated. So if I hear audible wheezing, what should I do to treat it? Probably give albuterol or atrovent. Uh, if I hear gurgling, I need to suction. If I hear snoring, I have a, an airway obstruction, I need to reposition the airway or maybe insert an adjunct. If I have strider, that tells me that their airway is narrowing down for whatever reason. This could be an allergic reaction, it could be epiglottitis. I need to address it by treating appropriately with the right medications. So all of these lung sounds or airway sounds will clue me in as to what could be going on with my patient and what I need to do to treat them. When I listen to lung sounds, I do it through auscultation, right? I use that stethoscope and I apply the stethoscope to both upper and lower fields on both sides, trying to listen around. Keep in mind that with congestive heart failure, uh, when the patient develops that, that pulmonary edema, the fluid will first be heard in the lower fields and then it'll, it will expand upward over time simply because gravity pulls that fluid down into the lower components of the lungs. So here's a, a great example of assessing the patient. Now what I want you to note here is that this patient's already on oxygen while the care provider is doing his assessment. If this guy was in such bad shape that he needed oxygen right away, then we should treat it immediately and then complete the remainder of our assessment afterward. We can always tone back oxygen. We could always change our treatment plan if we need to. I can tell you that with our most severe patients, we usually go through a whole bunch of different things. We start with a non-rebreather, and while they're on the non-rebreather, we'll prep the NEB kit, we'll give them the NEB kit, and if the NEB kit isn't enough, then maybe we have to put them on a nasal cannula along with the NEB kit to get the additional oxygen. Sometimes we've got to flip them back over to the non-rebreather, then we decide, well, let's try the CPAP, see if CPAP will work, and then eventually we may end up, as an ALS provider, sedating them and intubating them. So there's just a lot of stuff going on there that, uh, um, you know, it, it makes it difficult with our respiratory patients to come up with just one single plan of care that's going to be effective all the time. Sometimes we have to do a little trial and error. Wheezing, we know, is from bronchoconstriction, right? The, the smooth muscle that surrounds the bronchioles has constricted down on it like a boa constrictor would on its prey. And as a result, the airway passages are narrowed. That's what gives you that musical uh, wheezing sound that you hear. In addition to that, if this is an asthma patient, not only would you have bronchoconstriction, but now the asthma patients will also be dumping mucus into their lungs. So that will even, even further narrow down the airway passages. Rails or crackles are both terms that are used interchangeably. And those, will, uh, those indicate uh, fine watery secretions within the alveoli. And that's typically indicative of some level of pulmonary edema typically resulting from a near drowning or congestive heart failure. Ronchi is a, is a coarse, um, thick, mucusy sound. It sounds more like a rattle than anything else. Um, and that is a lot of times you'll hear that with people who have been smoking for years, people that have uh, uh, bad respiratory infections where they have that thick mucus buildup inside the lungs there. Strider is that high-pitched whistling sound. That's typically uh, found up around the epiglottis or the tops of the airway, uh, tops of the trachea or the lower airway there. And what that is, is as things start to swell up, maybe from an airway burn, from infection, something like that, then those airway passages narrow. And as we push a bunch of air through that tiny little opening, it creates a whistling sound. Not much different than you would with your lips if you were trying to whistle. So this slide just kind of addresses some of the physiologic issues that we could see associated with difficulty breathing. You know, considering the, the ventilation perfusion matches, if the respiratory rate increases, therefore so should the pulse rate to try to offset. Um, you know, why is it that the respiratory and pulse rates are increasing? Is it because of a hypotension issue, lack of perfusion? Um, the slide really doesn't tell you much of anything other than you need to understand the physiology of the vital signs. How are they related? What do they suggest or indicate? And by understanding that, it's going to help you piece together a few different pieces of a puzzle that will give you a, a clearer picture of what's wrong with your patient and allow you to determine that appropriate treatment plan. So if they are having difficulty breathing, first and foremost, is it adequate, yes or no? Uh, 
If they are breathing adequately to sustain life, provide them with supplemental oxygen. If it is inadequate to the point that they are altered, unconscious, or anything else, then we're going to go ahead and have to stop, provide those positive pressure ventilations while we're trying to determine what the underlying cause is. I'm not going to go through the specifics on, on setting up an oxygen tank. That's stuff you should have covered already. But I do want to roll into some of the different devices that we have to treat our patients. Uh, we've talked about nasal cannulas and non-rebreather masks in excess in chapters 9 and 10. Now we want to look here at the use of continuous positive airway pressure, or CPAP. CPAP, CPAP for the longest time was an ALS skill. Um, recently, about uh, five or six years ago, it was dropped down to a BLS skill. And there's really no reason that it shouldn't be. CPAP really is a great tool. And the way it works is that it, it takes constant air pressure. Right? It, it doesn't just deliver short bursts of pressure or air. It's constant. And it forces that pressure down into the lungs. And in the presence of pulmonary edema, or fluid inside the alveoli there, it actually pushes some fluid back out into the interstitial area, and other fluid it pushes off to the side. And as it pushes it off to the side, it, it frees up some of that surface area of the alveoli, and that's where the gas exchange occurs. So it displaces the fluid, pushes it out of the way, and allows for that exchange to occur. What it does not do is, is suck fluid out of the lungs or pull fluid out of the lungs, um, it simply uh, keeps it inside the body, pushes it back into some of the interstitial areas, and it also pushes it off to the side, allowing for that gas exchange to occur. So what do we use it for? Pulmonary edema is probably the biggest thing, secondary to congestive heart failure or a near drowning. Um, asthma and COPD from time to time, uh, it is typically not as effective with those patients. Um, but some protocols in certain circumstances may suggest its use. And then respiratory failure in general. Now, here's the deal, though. If a patient's going into respiratory failure, that means that their rate is dropping down to inadequate areas where we should have to be ventilating the patient. So in this situation here, if we need to be ventilating them because it's inadequate, then CPAP is not appropriate. CPAP is not a ventilation device. It is a constant po a positive airway pressure, but it is not a ventilation device that could be used for inadequate breathing. So if my patient's inadequate, I would take the CPAP off them and I would start using my BVM to ventilate them. As with any device or procedure, there's indications and contraindications. The previous slide discussed some of the indications for it. Contraindications to the use of CPAP includes altered mental status, if their blood pressure drops down too low, where they become hemodynamically unstable, um, or general inability for them to sit up and maintain their own airway. Any of those situations there would necessitate that we remove the CPAP and that we consider other forms of treatment, including positive pressure ventilations. Additional contraindications include nausea and vomiting. Obviously, if the patient's vomiting, having a mask sealed to their face would be counterproductive. Uh, any type of penetrating chest trauma, including something like an um, open pneumothorax, would not be appropriate for CPAP. Uh, shock, any upper, type, or any upper GI bleeds, or the inability to maintain a good mask seal due to obesity, facial hair, etc. I've also got, uh, uh, in the skills manual, if you reference back to that, it gives you a complete list of all the indications, contraindications, and other important things that you need to, to remember about the use of CPAP. So looking here, you've got your indication, respiratory distress, secondary to pulmonary edema, and then from there, all of your contraindications. You also have pregnancy and patients under the age of 18 listed on here, and it's got a handful of other things, including your procedures. So be sure that you review this in addition to the practice in class. So what are some of the potential consequences of using CPAP? Hypotension probably being one of the biggest ones. As we increase that intrathoracic pressure, we have the potential to apply pressure to the inferior and superior vena cava, reducing blood return to the heart. When that happens, that obviously less blood in means less blood out. We decrease our cardiac output, and ultimately we decrease our blood pressure. So if we're getting a lot of oxygen into the body, but our pressure is decreasing, we don't have enough pressure to administer or deliver that oxygen to the cells, it's not very effective. Uh, the pneumothorax increased risk of aspiration and drying of corneas, those things aren't really too, too applicable because in those situations we should probably avoid putting the CPAP on in the first place.
If we are going to use the CPAP, we're going to go through the specific procedures in class, but it is important that you explain to the patient exactly what's going to happen. Uh, generally, this is an uncomfortable procedure for a patient, especially if they've never used a CPAP before. It actually makes them feel like it's even more difficult to breathe. But what ultimately happens is it's delivering the additional oxygen there. It's allowing that perfusion to occur, and over time, the patient will begin to improve. But it's a, it's a big mental hurdle for them to accept the CPAP and to allow it to do its work. So again, that's all stuff that we will practice in class, and we'll talk about that a lot more. If the patient does begin to deteriorate, if it's not working, if they become altered, if their blood pressure drops too low, we're going to have to remove the CPAP and we begin ventilating them with a BVM as necessary. All right, from here we're going to start talking about some different respiratory conditions. Uh, there's a handful of, of common respiratory conditions that we'll run into on a regular basis and the appropriate ways to treat them. We'll start with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. Now, COPD is a general term that's used to describe several different diseases, uh, but generally, if you look at it, it, it explains itself. It's a chronic respiratory illness that patients have on a repeated basis. Uh, a lot of times, it's going to be related to emphysema, chronic bronchitis, or a black lung. Um, emphysema is probably going to be the most common out of all of those. All of our emphysema patients typically will tell you not that they have emphysema, but that they have Our emphysema patients will typically tell us that they have COPD, not necessarily that they have emphysema. Uh, it doesn't make a difference. The treatment is going to be the same. We'll start, uh, first of all, with chronic bronchitis then. So with bronchitis, looking at that word, it's, it's inflammation of the bronchioles themselves. The lining within the bronchioles becomes inflamed. Uh, it retains fluid within the linings there. And ultimately, it narrows the passages of the airways. Therefore, it reduces the volume of air that can be distributed. In addition to that, because of the inflammation, it's typically associated with some level of infection. And when that occurs, we're also dumping excess mucus into the, uh, into the lungs there, which further reduces the air passages. You'll see here in these pictures that you've got a normal alveoli that has a sufficient amount of surface area. Wherever you see the, the lining or the walls of the alveoli here, that's where gas exchange can occur. So the more surface area, the more gas can extru uh, the more gas exchange can occur. And keep in mind that you've got the capillaries that are surrounding each and every one of these alveoli. So it allows for a pretty efficient process. With chronic bronchitis, not only do we have inflammation, right, where the, the linings of the bronchioles begin to swell up, but we also now have this mucus that's introduced in here. That mucus covers some of the surface area. It reduces the area available for diffusion of gases, and the inflamed bronchioles themselves reduce the quantity or volume of, of air that makes it down to the alveoli in the first place. So this becomes a pretty big issue. A lot of us have probably had bronchitis at some point in the past, and simply having bronchitis does not give you COPD. It has to be a chronic issue where it's uh, happening multiple times a year over a period of time, at which point your doctor may uh, diagnose you with a COPD issue. With emphysema then, which is what we're going to talk about next, it's a little bit different. Now you've got the breakdown of the alveoli walls here. and You'll see where the alveoli walls are present. Now those begin to break down. You lose the elasticity here. So we've lost surface area. We've lost expansion capabilities. And as a result, we lose uh, significant amounts of diffusion area that uh, limits our patient's oxygen intake and ultimately makes them chronically distressed. All right, so moving on to asthma then. Uh, asthma, I'm sure many people listening to this have experienced asthma in the past or know somebody that has asthma. Relatively common. Um, asthma itself can be truly a critical issue depending on the severity of the asthma response. Um, there are patients that have just minor responses, feel a little short of breath and wheezy, taking albuterol and they're good to go. There's other patients that constrict down so badly that they require intubation and, uh, and additional medications. So there's a, a significant range of asthma. And although it is considered chronic because it's a, a long-term diagnosis, each of the exacerbations are, are truly acute in nature where they just pop up randomly based on some type of uh, trigger and uh, they could potentially be immediately life-threatening. So what happens with asthma is the bronchioles themselves constrict down, the smooth muscle around the 
uh, the bronchioles constricts, uh, it, it squeezes down, narrows the airway passages, and then in addition to that, we dump mucus in there. So we have a significantly reduced tidal volume at that point. Uh, we are getting a lot less air down to the alveoli, but even more so, we're not able to get air out of the alveoli. So what happens is we get a lot of air trapping. And with the air trapping, we're retaining a lot of carbon dioxide, and we're having uh, a lot of issues with our pH balance then. With wheezing, or with, uh, with bronchial constriction, we get wheezing. And that's when we listen to lung sounds, we should be able to hear that, that wheezing sound. However, in severe situations, we'll actually hear the wheezing audibly as we walk up to the patient. We could hear it from several feet away. So these are all things that we should be observing in addition to the overall work of breathing, uh, tripoding, and other indications of severe distress. So it says here airflow mainly restricted in one direction, and that's that's really the true uh, the truth. Usually we get wheezing on inhalation, and that's because as as the chest expands, it creates that vacuum and it forcibly draws that air in. Um, when we get both inspiratory and expiratory wheezing, that's when we know that we're really in in tough shape. Okay, those are the patients that need aggressive uh, treatment and rapid transport. And now let's talk about pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema can happen uh, from a multitude of different sources. Most frequently for us, we deal with it secondary to congestive heart failure. However, something like a near drowning could be an issue. Um, other infections could cause pulmonary edema. But more frequently than anything else, it's that congestive heart failure. What happens with pulmonary edema is we have a buildup of fluid uh, inside the alveoli, and that buildup of fluid prevents the diffusion of gases from occurring. When that occurs, uh, obviously we end up retaining a lot of carbon dioxide within the body and we become hypoxic or oxygen deficient um, as we try to metabolize. Common signs and symptoms of pulmonary edema uh, are as stated on the screen. You know, short of reading those and memorizing them, just think to yourself, if I have fluid inside my lungs, what would be the, the signs and symptoms? And obviously shortness of breath would be the big thing. Um, if the patient has a cough, because anytime we have foreign objects inside of our lungs, whether it be dirt, fluid, or anything else, our natural response is to cough. So if the patient's coughing and they have a, a pink frothy sputum that they tend to be coughing up, that would be a suggestion for pulmonary edema. If they tell you that they have a hard time breathing more so when they lay down than when they sit up, that's a big indicator because gravity is going to pull that pulmonary edema down into the lower fields initially, but if a patient lays flat, such as if they were to go to bed, that fluid distributes throughout the lungs then, and it becomes far worse. So patients with congestive heart failure a lot of times need to sit up, they want to sit straight up, and they're trying to minimize the, uh, the amount of surface area that the, the fluid is actually covering. Uh, tachycardia, it, just depending on what's causing the, the backup of fluid, if it's a, a heart issue, it could be tachycardia or bradycardia, it could be hyper or hypotension. You know, there's a lot of potential uh, issues that could be going on there. So looking strictly at our vital signs won't really clue us in. Big things are going to be complaint to shortness of breath, rails or crackles for lung sounds, and the potential for that uh, pink frothy sputum, in addition to other standard respiratory issues that we would expect. So how do we treat this pulmonary edema? It's going to be with that CPAP that we talked about. And that CPAP pressurizes the inside of the lungs, pushes that fluid off to the side, and allows for the diffusion of gases to occur. Pneumonia. With pneumonia, that's typically from an infection. And the patient will have recent history of some level of illness, uh, fever, that type of thing. And that pneumonia, this is no longer chronic, right? We're, we're outside of the chronic issues. Although you can have chronic pneumonia, more often than not, this is going to be an acute issue. And as that uh, infection occurs, whatever part of the lung becomes infected, that's where we start to see a, an inflammatory response and a mucus buildup. If it is a single pneumonia, one-sided, it's usually treated or it's usually associated with a, a sharp chest pain, a little bit of shortness of breath, but general fatigue and, and just not feeling well. From time to time that infection spreads or it can even become a double pneumonia where it can be uh, multiple infections within the lungs. That's when our patients really become short of breath um, and we have the risk for sepsis and other big issues from there. So uh, with pneumonia, uh, we should be able to identify it through a complaint of shortness of breath 
um, the presence of uh, an underlying infection suggested by a fever. And then as we listen to lung sounds, we're probably going to hear some type of rails or crackles, but it's going to be localized. So those rails or crackles may only be on one side instead of the other. Maybe it's in the top fields instead of the lower fields. And that's how we would differentiate that pneumonia from the congestive heart failure or from the pulmonary edema from congestive heart failure. And the reason we need to be able to differentiate that is because we're going to treat them very differently. We are not typically going to administer CPAP for a pneumonia patient. Okay, um, So treatment there is going to be oxygen therapy. Uh, provide them with whatever amount of oxygen is necessary to, uh, to address the complaint of shortness of breath, to give them some level of, of uh, comfort, and then transport them. Spontaneous pneumothorax is when a hole in the lung spontaneously bursts. This can be caused from uh, thin, thinning out or blebs within the lung tissues itself. And as somebody's breathing, or especially if they end up having a cough, um, it can cause one of those blebs to kind of burst, and it leaves a small hole in the lung tissue, allowing air to escape out into the pleural cavity within the, the chest. Um, we do have a demographic that is most common with this, and that's those tall, thin people, and especially if they smoke. Uh, the taller they are, the thinner they are, it ends up stretching out that, uh, that lung tissue. And then by smoking, obviously we've seen what a smoker's lung looks like. Um, that, that lung tissue loses a lot of elasticity. So when they do begin to cough or something else, it's a lot easier for that hole to get popped. When they have it, uh, they're going to complain of that sharp pleuritic pain. They're going to complain of shortness of breath. And initially, that spontaneous pneumothorax is going to be relatively small and what we consider a simple pneumothorax. But as it expands over time, and that air pressure within the chest continues to, to increase, it collapses the lung. As that lung begins to collapse, they're going to become very short of breath. Um, they're going to have increased pain, and that's going to require a, a rapid intervention. Typically, from an ALS perspective, or even in the hospital, they're going to do what's called a needle decompression, or they could even put a chest tube in, depending on how much pressure is in there. Treatment for this is going to be uh, high flow oxygen and rapid transport. They're going to be hypoxic in this situation because we've significantly reduced the number of alveoli available for diffusion. So give them the oxygen so that the alveoli that are still working effectively um, are maximizing the oxygen administration and then make sure that we are not using CPAP here. As you can imagine, if we were to use this continuous positive airway pressure, it's going to force the air out that hole and further collapse the lung. Uh, pulmonary embolism then. Uh, PE is what it's typically known as and when a clot breaks away uh, from somewhere in the body and that, that uh, embolism or that clot gets lodged in the lung that's when we get that PE. So essentially if a clot breaks free in the body it could get lodged in the brain and cause a stroke, it could get lodged in the heart causing a heart attack, or it could get lodged in the lung ca causing a, a PE. Um, in this situation here blood flow uh, to those certain areas of the heart is going to be restricted, therefore not allowing for the off gas of carbon dioxide or the uptake of oxygen. You're going to have a significant amount of pain depending on where the clot gets lodged in the lungs and the size of the, the clot. It could significantly impact diffusion uh, capabilities and the patient's going to become extremely hypoxic relatively quickly. Um, so they're going to complain of the sudden onset shortness of breath. They're probably going to have that sharp pleuritic chest pain. Um, and they're going to see, you're going to see rapidly dropping SpO2 numbers. Um, you know, when we look at things associated with shortness of breath, such as anxiety, anxiety is not caused by pul pulmonary embolism. Anxiety is caused by a, uh, a, by the shortness of breath itself and the fact that the brain isn't being perfused adequately. And the brain, as a response, it kicks in this, this sympathetic response, this anxiety response, and it, it's kind of an indication to the person, hey, you know, help me, I need more oxygen, quick, find, find a solution or something bad is going to happen. Treatment for a PE is going to be rapid transport and oxygen is necessary. So you'll see here the treatment for nearly all of these things is, is very, very similar. Epiglottitis, typically most, uh, most seen in kids. And what ends up happening is due to infection, the epiglottis itself starts to swell up and become inflamed. When that occurs, it uh, reduces the airflow through the glottic opening and reduces the amount of oxygen that the patient's able to take in. Uh, typically associated with illness, you're going to have indications from fever, something like that, um, and the strider is going to be the big thing. So if we have a young child that's drooling a lot because they're unable to swallow, uh, 
they're uh, very fatigued, they're not acting right, and they have strider. Those are all big things that we're, we should associate with epiglottitis. Epiglottitis is truly a life-threatening condition, especially for kids, uh, requiring immediate rapid transport and high-flow oxygen. What we want to be careful of with epiglottitis is that we don't actually put anything in the airway that would stimulate the epiglottis to, to begin to swell up any more than it already has. So we're not going to put an oropharyngeal airway in. We're not going to put a, a king tube in or an eye gel or anything else. These kids, it's just high flow oxygen, rapid transport to the nearest hospital. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease and it causes a, a significant buildup of thick, sticky mucus inside the lungs. And as that buildup occurs, it makes it very difficult for the patient to breathe. Now, this is something that uh, people are typically diagnosed with in childhood. And although the life expectancy has certainly expanded over time with additional treatments, um, it was not uncommon for a patient not to make it out of their 20s with cystic fibrosis. I'm not quite sure what the life expectancy is with this now. Uh, I, last I checked, I believe it was up into the 30s or 40s. Um, Patients with cystic fibrosis will most likely know it. They'll tell you that that's what their diagnosis is, that they're having a flare-up. Again, nothing we can do for these patients other than rapid transport and high-flow oxygen. And all of our signs and symptoms are going to be associated with the general shortness of breath. Viral respiratory infections. We'll see this a lot in the wintertime or around flu season. Um, history of illness, right? They're not feeling good mucus buildups, it's going to be similar to pneumonias, um, and in those situations, again, simply high flow oxygen and rapid transport. All right, we're going to go ahead and move into a couple other uh, devices that we have available to us to use, the prescribed inhaler. Um, this is something that we talked a little bit about with in the pharmacology chapter, but essentially the inhaler allows for an aerosolized medication such as albuterol to be taken as needed. Uh, these are given to patients um, that they carry around with them when they begin to have a, a respiratory issue, shortness of breath, especially with asthma. Um, then they'll end up popping a couple puffs of these and they'll should hopefully help them out. Uh, from time to time, though, the inhaler is not enough, and a lot of times that's when we end up getting the 911 call or the patient presents to the hospital on their own. As with anything, because the inhaler has a medication in it, we need to verify the five rights and go through it just like we would any other medication. You'll see that some, especially with kids, have these spacer devices on them. And that spacer device just simply allows additional air. So as that puff goes in, the patient may not breathe it all in on that first inhalation. And this keeps the, the medication uh, localized within that chamber, allowing for all of the medication to be taken up and none of it to be wasted. If you are going to assist the patient with their inhaler, uh, this is something that they should know how to do on their own. I can't think of too many reasons why you would need to assist them unless they're so tired for whatever reason that they can't do it on their own. But just instruct them to seal their lips around the, the inhaler or the spacer device. And one, two, three, they inhale. And at the same time they inhale, you give a puff. Most of them are one to two puffs is the proper dosing. More often than not, though, in the, hospital, or in the ambulance, we're going to be using a, uh, a nebulizer kit, which is what you see here where there's a chamber that allows us to squirt medication in there. We run six liters of oxygen up into that chamber, aerosolizes the medication, and the patient's able to breathe it in. This tube on the other end here acts, again, as a spacer, so allowing some of the medication to stay retained, but it also pushes the mist away from the patient. Uh, if you remember, the ipratropium bromide, or the, uh, the atrovent that we use, can cause some eye irritation. So by using this, this nebulizer kit with the spacer on here, it forces the air out away from the patient. So talking about that small volume nebulizer then, uh, it has that reservoir where we can squirt either the albuterol and or the atrovent in there. We can run the, the tubing up into the bottom, run it at six liters, and that's sufficient to aerosolize the medication, allowing them to, uh, to breathe it in. Those nebulizers will take anywhere from five to 10 minutes to aerosolize everything. So we'll continue to allow the patient to do that. If the patient's unable to hold it up like we saw in that picture, we actually have aerosol masks where we can put the same equipment on there, but we just clip it to a mask and we put that on the patient, and then they don't have to hold it up. And that's it. There's a lot of information there. I tried to speed it up toward the end. 
Um, this is, you know, the, the difficult thing as we get into the medical chapters here is you are going to be presented with just countless numbers of, of ailments, illnesses, and everything else that we, we need to try to understand. My recommendation to you is that you start making flashcards. And along with the flashcards, don't simply write down all the signs and symptoms on, on the backside and memorize it. Understand why those signs and symptoms exist. And a prime example is going to be the anxiety. You don't need to write down anxiety as a sign and symptom for every single respiratory illness that a patient may have. Understand that as a patient becomes hypoxic, as the brain isn't perfused adequately, they're going to become anxious. And that's going to apply for every respiratory issue you can imagine. That's going to apply for every form of shock. You know, that, that general understanding applies to so many different patient presentations. So again, really begin looking at the underlying physiology of all these things. What is occurring? Why is it occurring? What is the relationship between all these different signs and symptoms? And develop that better level of understanding. Simply memorizing signs and symptoms will not be sufficient. Okay? Uh, so with that, we'll do lots of scenarios in class. We're going to reinforce this content extensively. Um, so if this is just kind of a, uh, if your mind is a little fried after this, that's okay. Minus two after doing the lecture, we'll do a lot more reinforcement in class.